Good afternoon. We are breaking into programming now with some breaking news from the federal court in Mecklenburg County. Charlotte Mayor Patrick Cannon has been arrested on federal public corruption charges. Now, we have just received the release from the Department of Justice, and I'm going to have to read to you. He's been charged with theft and bribery charges. We do have Rad Berkey right now. He's at the federal courthouse. He was there as the mayor was going into court this morning and also as he was leaving. I believe we're ready to go down to Rad right now. Rad? Well, Sonia, it was, uh, it was just a disquieting moment in the federal courthouse here. We were the only station to be here. There were very few people in the courtroom. At one point, the judge told the mayor, you may not be in possession of any firearms or anything like that, and that the FBI had uh, agreed that they were going to go to the mayor's home and actually take whatever firearms he had there. The other thing he told the, the mayor at one point, he said, Good luck to you, Mr. Cannon. And at that point, Pat Cannon said, thank you, sir. And that was about all that happened in court. But let me review for you a little bit about what is in this. This is a 48-page 48 48 complaint filed by the FBI that has been conducting an undercover investigation against Pat Cannon. From a quick read of it, as you have already said, he's charged with a Hobbs Act violation, theft, bribery, and wire fraud. What the FBI is saying is that they actually conducted an undercover investigation with FBI agents actually posing as real estate developers. The case started January of 2013 and wrapped up in February of this year. It just in February, they said at some point the FBI agents met with the mayor. They gave him amounts of cash totaling $48,000. He also accepted airline tickets hotel rooms, and, as the complaint says, a luxury apartment, the use of a luxury apartment. The FBI complaint also says that the last payment that the mayor accepted from an undercover agent was $20,000 in cash in the mayor's office at the government center. We are continuing to review the complaint, Sonia, but as the mayor was leaving, we again were the only ones there, had an opportunity to talk to him, and here's what he had to say. We'll be certainly willing to talk to you a little bit later on, okay? What but happened? You. Can you tell us what happened? Well, nothing at this point that I can discuss, but I'll certainly be back in contact with you about it. What would you tell the voters of the city today, sir? Well, there's nothing too much I can say at this point, so, but uh, when I'm able to, I'll certainly touch base back with you. What is your reaction to the charge? Guilty? Not guilty? Uh, you know, at this point, there's nothing to respond to at this juncture, so I'll, I'll certainly circle back with you, though. Thank what? you. Gotcha. So you are looking at tape right there of Charlotte Mayor Patrick Cannon leaving the federal courthouse earlier today where he was arrested on charges, public corruption charges. Sonia, let me show you the scene here behind me. It really sets the stage. You can see multiple unmarked cars here behind me along this short street. Those are the cars of federal agents now inside his home. They've been going inside that open garage door you see on the side of the home. This is a home he's lived with with his wife of 17 years and their three children. Now we know during his brief court appearance this afternoon, the judge remarked that he would have to surrender all guns. So we can assume that more than likely those, those agents are seizing some of those guns and we don't know what else they might be going in and getting at this point. NBC Charlotte breaking the bombshell today of a corruption scandal in Charlotte. Mayor Patrick Cannon arrested on federal corruption charges. NBC Charlotte received a tip from a confidential source, and we broke this story on air. And we were the only ones in the courtroom when the charges were read to him. Tonight, Mayor Cannon faces charges of theft, bribery, wire fraud, and extortion. And NBC Charlotte cameras caught FBI agents searching easy parking at 300 West Trade Street. Mayor Cannon is the chief executive officer of that business. We saw several FBI vans on the scene. They're among the items the FBI is looking for there, a financial records for Cannon and his wife, tax forms, and mobile telephones. NBC Charlotte I-Team reporter Stuart Watson is combing through the 42-page criminal complaint. He is live in the studio right now with a closer look at the charges the mayor is facing. Well, Angie, this 42-page sworn statement from an FBI agent is not at all dull reading. It tells us the Fed's version of backroom meetings, secret phone calls, a Las Vegas trip, and tens of thousands of dollars in cash. 
The FBI affidavit says that the agent made the first cash bribe by placing $12,500 in cash on a coffee table, at which point the FBI says Cannon looked nervously toward the window and covered the money with a folder. The undercover agent got up and closed the blinds, at which point they say Cannon placed the money near his ear and fanned the bills. But later, Cannon called the undercover agent to say, I'm not one of those Chicago or Detroit type folk. That's not how I flow. But in a much later conversation, when Cannon was bragging about his political connections, even in the White House, the undercover agent says, you haven't even hit the pinnacle of your political career yet, have you, Patrick? It will be fun to watch you the next 10, 15, 20 years. Watch where you go. And of course, the double entendre there, the agent or Patrick Cannon hearing, watch where your political career will go. The FBI agent knowing, watch if you're going to prison for 10 or 15 or, or 20 years. Now, word spread quickly of the charges. NBC Charlotte reporter Diane Gallagher is live in Uptown tonight at the Government Center with reaction there. Diane, we just heard from city leaders. <laughs> Yeah, David, you know, it seems that city leaders found out around the same time that our own Rad Berkey found out and was at the federal courthouse today. They they were really shocked when they came in here. We'd waited for about two hours on the second floor of the government building for city leaders to come and make a statement. Council members and city manager Ron Carley finally came in about 445 to talk to us about their reaction to Mayor Patrick Cannon's arrest. Here's what they had to say about how they found out. The first any of us learned about the investigation is when the FBI served a search warrant on the mayor's office at noon today. Over the years, the NBC Charlotte Eye team has repeatedly raised questions about Patrick Cannon using his office for personal gain, and we aired those reports long before the FBI's investigation began. Eye team reporter Stuart Watson challenged Cannon years ago. Patrick Cannon's company, Easy Parking, won a lucrative contract with the Charlotte Convention Center way back in 2002 while he was on the city council. Patrick Cannon either knew some people that, had to, 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 that made the decision or that the people that made the decision was influenced because of, of, of who he was. At the time, Cannon assured me he would never profit from his influence. If there's anything that's out of line spiritually, morally, or ethically, uh, it's something that Easy Parking would not pursue. When losing bidders complained, it looked like Cannon had a conflict of interest. Here's what he told me. I think that's an unfair assessment. You know, the sky appears to be blue, but it's not. Because 75% of the earth is water. And it reflects off of the ionosphere. So, I mean, appearances? No. But two years later, in 2004, the NBC Charlotte Eye team was again alone in asking questions about Cannon profiting from his position. This time, his company won a bid to provide parking services at Carolina's Medical Center, a public hospital, even though he was not the low bidder. Easy Parking's bid described Cannon as, quote, a highly visible member of the city council and said he had special access, quote, to contact the necessary authorities to promptly resolve any emergency. Uh, it's a typographical error. Something shouldn't be there because obviously no one ever contacts me about those things anywhere from CNC. And I think it would be probably inappropriate for me to do, do that kind of thing anyway. But that is exactly what he's being charged with doing some 10 years later. It's inappropriate, in my opinion, to go out and use your title for, uh, for something that might uh, give you the edge, per se. Again, Cannon insisted Easy Parking was just the best company for the job. I would imagine in CMC's mind, we were the best qualified to go in and to perform the job accordingly. Don't think it had anything to do with you being a highly visible member of the city council? I sincerely doubt that. <laughs> I've probably lost deals because I'm a member of the city council more than I've gained deals by way of being a member of the city council. Then three years ago, Cannon was again accused of using his influence. The issue back then was not his company, but a lucrative contract to provide taxicab service at the Charlotte Douglas Airport. The two winning bidders at the airport paid $5,000 each to be members of the Hospitality and Tourism Alliance, called the HTA. Patrick Cannon was on the HTA board and on the city council committee that oversaw taxicab licensing. Does the HTA get any more influence because Patrick Cannon is on its board? Absolutely not, and let me tell you exactly why. One is, is that Patrick Cannon is there by way of his company, his private business. He's not there by way of his public uh, hat that he wears. 
But Mohammed Mustafa, the owner of Universal Cab, complained bitterly that Cannon was corrupt. Now he feels vindicated. I pray God all along that the dark it come to light. And yesterday was the, all the dark had come back to light. And today, Mohammed Mustafa of Universal Cab says he took his evidence back to the FBI, which he says has renewed interest in the taxicab contract as this investigation continues. Now at five, dramatic developments in the search for a missing girl. Investigators swarmed the Salisbury home where she lived before she disappeared. From Airstar, you can see investigators combing Casey and Sandy Parsons' house on Miller Chapel Road in Salisbury. The search and attempt to find anything that will help them answer four key questions. Where is 15-year-old Erica Parsons? What happened to her? Who, if anyone, is responsible for her disappearance? And why? Part of the search focusing on the back wooden deck, looking under it and the house. The same backyard and deck the Parsons showed us last week and expected investigators to search after the Parsons say their older son, who reported Erica missing, claimed the parents killed her and buried her in the backyard. Said that we killed her and buried her in our backyard. And that's what they was asking. Did we kill her and bury her? And your answer? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. New dramatic details in the case of a missing teenager. NBC Charlotte uncovers shocking revelations as search warrants in the Erica Parsons case go public for the first time. The extensive search of Casey and Sandy Parsons' home on Miller Chapel Road Wednesday in Salisbury found red stains on a pair of pants, on drywall, on closet baseboards, and on the floor. Investigators took wall swabs from different locations. They also found two knives wrapped in shrink wrap and a book about the John Benet Ramsey unsolved murder from years ago in Colorado, with notes in that book about how to remodel a house, plus a plastic bag of John Benet Ramsey magazines. Evidence meant to help investigators find 15 year old Erica Parsons, missing from the family home for two years, but just reported missing two weeks ago. Family attorney Carlisle Sherrill. They're just looking for anything they can find that'll help. We want to help every, any way we can to find Erica. In making their case for probable cause, investigators cite other relatives who accuse mom Casey Parsons of ongoing abuse. That one time Casey admitted losing control and beating Erica. That Erica, at just six years old, told a relative her parents hit her. And that Casey always blamed marks on Erica's body on someone else. And Casey brought Erica back home because she was afraid DSS would find Erica wasn't there. But the family was still getting monthly checks from the government as Erica's adoptive parents. What do you have to say? about these warrants. One person not answering our questions Thursday, Erica's dad, Sandy Parsons, after being interviewed for hours by the FBI. Tonight, the parents of a missing Rowan County teenager have packed up and moved out of their home. The Parsons family is simply not talking about their move, but in talking with the family attorney, well, he says pretty clear, the family simply tired of all the attention that they've been getting. And this is video of the move here, the moving truck pulling up late this morning. Family and friends started loading furniture, electronics, and other household items into a large U-Haul. They also, after that, that headed north on I-85 over the Yadkin River Bridge into Davidson County. And our last check through Airstar has them in the Siler City area in eastern North Carolina. Our camera, the only one there as the grandparents of missing teen Erica Parsons went back into the home where she once lived. As you can see in some of this video, the home left in complete disarray. Our quality of life is going to change a little bit. We're not going to do what we plan to do tonight. I plan to go to the Duke Carolina game tonight. I'm not going. <laughs> Would have loved that, but looking forward to that game. I'm not going. I'm staying off the roads. Go out to Michelle Bowden. She's headed to Elizabeth area where there's another accident. You can see that dash cam there. What do you have for us, Michelle? <laughs> Hey, and I don't know if you can see driving down on the other side of the road from us, two snow plows are passing us right now, and it's a good thing because the road we're on right now, Park Road in the South Park area, just talking to my photographer, Ken Shermer, who is driving, he's saying the roads are really getting slick. And that's outbound independence. That, those were people leaving work uh, once the snow started. And when you look at the, uh, the traffic maps, it's every outbound interstate and thoroughfare out of Uptown is the one that's clogged right now um, because everybody left at the same time, even though it was probably 
maybe two-thirds, a half of a normal workday because of uh, some businesses closing, it wasn't enough. We had everybody leaving at the same time. Thankfully, there's no school buses on the roads. Um, uh, most people stayed off the roads. But the problem was during the morning rush hour, it was not snowing. So it's really hard. I know I, we've been preaching this for two or three days, but I understand if you get up in the morning and it's not snowing, you think, okay, I'll go to work. And then if it does start snowing, I will leave. The problem is the first half inch of snow glazed these streets over instantly. So by the time it started snowing, it was already too late for a lot of these people uh, to be out there. So when you look at first warm Doppler radar, let's show you real quickly because I want to show you how things are unfolding out there. We've got a mix of snow and sleet across the area. And a lot of people look at the radar and the first thing they want to say is, hey, it looks like the end is coming to a near, uh, coming, you know, it's going to be near pretty soon back here to the west. Here's the thing about this system. It's actually developing on the coast. So what's happening is this stuff is actually going to spread back this way. What you're looking at now is Interstate 85 right here in Gastonia. Slow going for a lot of drivers as the snow is coming down a lot harder. The interstate is holding up. We've seen some snow plows out there as well as right here on Cox Road. Drivers taking it slow as they go over this overpath. We're seeing a lot less cars out here. And for those folks who aren't taking to the roads, they say the driving is pretty bad. Crazy. It really is difficult to watch some of these cars trying to maneuver traffic just like they would on any other day. It's obviously not a typical day here in Charlotte, not typical traffic situation. And, you know, the the road the road crews did a lot of what they could do. It appeared beforehand with pre-treating this. But at this point, it's too cold and there's just too much falling for it to do any good for so that was if Kevin feel show there this bus right here is just weaving in and out of traffic as well this cat's bus you've got right up on that white car there uh, this semi truck appears to be struggling to get up the hill right now you can watch its wheels are sort of something we have other people now who are stuck in traffic so this is the situation that we're seeing right here well hello from Sochi from the Black Sea to the snow capped mountains these Olympics have been filled with unbridled joy and at times unbelievable disappointment. Today we take a look back at the sights and sounds of Sochi. I mean, it was, it was built in Charlotte. Uh, we used a wind tunnel in Charlotte. I tried my best. Um, I had good preparation. It just wasn't the race I was hoping for. Thick and thin, she's been there for me, supporting me, pushing me. My brother, I've trained with him like whole life. Because as a broadcaster, I'm not supposed to root for anyone. Um, <laughs> you know, deep down, I'm going to be. Uh, it feels like the Spring Olympics, maybe. <laughs> All those worries about snow in Sochi, no problem. This is gonna be big. I'm so stoked, I can't even put into words how excited I am. And... Well, I couldn't contain my emotions. The adrenaline, adrenaline went nuts. It's time to play Stump and Olympian. Ah! <laughs> he scores! Tell, tell me how your life has changed in the past two days here. Uh, just b besides all the media, uh, not much. The Mexican skiers. Well, what did you think about the rest of it? Oh, this one, for some reason, was hard to plan. That when you come here, you should not assume any privacy with respect to your communication devices. It's very heartbreaking. I'm a dog owner. Well, we're a wolf pack. We actually transition at night. That's our twilight. You guys kind of caught it. Well, the athletes were grown here. Why shouldn't their clothing be grown here? Will you watch the Olympics? Lord, no. That interfere with my other stuff. What if one of the Olympic athletes gave you a shout out from... Oh, boy, that would be great. I wanted to give a little shout out to Florine. Love the outfits. This is our last hurrah. We are here with Charlotte's own 1992 silver medalist, Paul Wiley. Hello, Charlotte! 
The Olympic movement is for sports, not politics. And I like to see the American flag fly.